Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues of the industry, it's my pleasure to be here with you today and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the organizer for having me and giving me the opportunity of taking you through Traveler Trends. Obviously, you're all familiar with Traveler Trends. You work with travelers. They're essential to your ecosystem and, and to our ecosystem in general, if you're talking about economy. So what we thought we'd do is try to aggregate as much air reservation information so that we can build a map of demand. It's all about all these people making their reservation and we process 15 million a day, whether that's China, the US, or wherever, MAM, PAPS, travel agency, online travel agency, whatever, the biggest possible database so that we can understand trends. So the purpose of today is to try to use this massive uh, um, information in order to zoom into some of the issues that the industry is facing right now. And obviously, I want to zoom into what happened in Paris and Brussels, and also here in the Middle East, forward-looking trends that are pretty negative, specifically when it comes to the Ramadan period, and that's the power of this information that is what it allows. So, there is a lot of data coming, and you know, as a data guy, I apologize, but I'm going to try to make that fun for you. I guarantee you this, some of the findings are very exciting. So in order to look at the situation in, in, in Paris slash Europe slash Brussels, because we don't know anymore, all this is so interrelated, if you will, um, I've decided to look at the map of the world in terms of arrivals as per forward keys database. It would be unfair to talk about data without spending 30 seconds on methodology. When I'm talking about arrivals here, I'm not talking about these people transiting through Dubai or wherever else or returning home. I'm talking about these travelers, these visitors that are staying into one of these destinations and are typical candidates for, you know, booking a hotel, right? So it's kind of a redesigned view of the world that kind of caters closer in a closer way to your system. So we will look at three slides. One is what was happening in the world before the Paris attack of November 13. Then we'll look at what was happening, what has happened in between Paris and Brussels and we'll look at after Brussels. Because I think a, major, a number of major events and of, of, of insights have happened that are needed to understand. The value of this obviously is tactical. The games have changed. When I used to help hoteliers to market themselves uh, 10 or 12 years ago, you know, it was kind of okay to say that, uh, at least in Europe, this year will be 5%, uh, like last year plus 5%, and then comes the boss, and the boss said, no, no, it's going to be plus 7, and then you negotiate it down to 6. But those days are gone, because a number of things are, are challenging this, 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 this pattern that we've been enjoying for a long time. So, again, I apologize for the numbers, but I'm trying to highlight some of the findings that I think are making this time worth it. First of all, if we look at the period in terms of arrivals, arrivals worldwide between summer 2015, right, and the Paris attack, we were overall 2.2% positive. Everything was good. And by the way, we kind of slotted in the Middle East as a contributor, which was 5.3. Middle East was a great, great a provider of, of, of uh, arrivals into, uh, 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 in, in the world in general. Europe was doing good. It was above par. Better than Asia-Pac, by the way, but not as well as Asia-Pac, as, as the Middle East, sorry. Now, once the Paris event happened, things started changing. Obviously, we lost that one point here in a, in a worldwide fashion, but Europe was impacted in terms of arrivals. That means all Europe. One, minus 1.5 percent, even though the contribution of Middle East remained positive. Right? On the other hand, what is interesting is that that hardly affected the Americas yet, but um, the Middle East and Asia Pac have been growing, you know, to get to 4.6 percent growth. When Brussels happened, well, it, it became a little bit even more complicated, obviously. So. I think overall, during that period of time that goes between Brussels and now, we are 0.7%, right? So our growth has taken a serious toll. And total international to Europe is still minus 4.4%, while Middle East is being growing and while Asia-Pac is being growing, um, I mean, quite aggressively. 
It's, these are lots of findings, and I'm drawing a number of lessons for this, but I keep that for the next, so the next slide. Now, when we turn forward and look at all these reservations that have already been made about people that have, through a reservation, committed to travel in the future, and we compare it to last year, which is what hotelier would call on the book, we're still at deficit, okay? Whether, when we look at basically from May 1st to September 30th, 2016, we're minus 2%. That means that the volume of arrivals is shrinking 2% when compared to last year. It is very logical because all these events have been impacting bookings. When you impact the bookings, you know that your future arrivals are impacted as well. So this is the, the, the long tail effect, I guess, of these events that are impacting arrivals. And as you can tell, it is seriously impacting Europe up to September. There is another side effect that is interesting with nothing to do with what we're talking about, but that's the Zika effect. The Zika effect has been pretty intense in the Caribbean and Central America, um, specifically in terms of bookings, uh, concerning all the uh, destinations that were listed by the World Health Organization as being impacted. Right? And that obviously is not contributing to the, to the health of, of overall uh, arrivals, if you're international arrivals. Right. I'm going to get into more into detail in the Paris impact, and actually that slide is just from a, from a, from a, from a Middle East perspective, if you will. The Middle East was a very strong contributor to, uh, to Europe in general, and starting uh, on November 14th uh, and following a huge um, uh, a list of cancellations, if you will, we're still in a deficit today, basically, you know, a couple of days ago, of 19% in terms of arrivals. This picture I'm drawing here uh, is from the Middle East, but frankly, we're 15% we're negative uh, when in, in a global fashion, so we have a problem. The level, the level of reservations as are, are pretty negative, and the recovery time is not uh, there. The number of bookings are not yet equaling the bookings we had in the past. That's what it means. So when you look at the Paris trends, obviously, you would want to say, well, after the UFS Cup, Soccer Cup, football, is happening in June, and that will help to salvage Paris. Well, this is the limit of the exercise, where you could see that there was a very positive plus 23% of people making reservation for the UFS Cup period. And in reality, following the attacks, you know, that uh, became a deficit. So yes, the UFS Cup is helping Paris to uh, get a new energy, to re-energize Paris. No, it is not uh, uh, um, uh, sufficient to bring Paris back to where it was. And actually, if you want to be very detailed, you can see that the main contributors to that success in Paris are the, 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 the playing uh, teams, right? So um, uh, Turkey, Croatia, France, I mean, Romania, Sweden are the strongest contributors are helping. But that's not enough to, brew, to bring Paris back in track. Quickly, I would like to go through Brussels. Brussels was still 90% down in terms of reservation. Well, that's quite logical. The airport was down, right? Um, but at the end of the day, the problem is that this huge deficit of bookings is leading to a huge deficit of future arrivals, which was already pretty negative before the attack in Brussels and is now, uh, uh, you know, a painful minus 36%. However, when we look at forward-looking arrivals and you compare the number of arrivals to, the, to, to, to last year, you do see that basically starting late August, uh, we might be uh, facing a situation that is getting back to normal. The lessons are threefold. The more you hit on destination, even though these, all these events are not comparable, the more you hit on destination, the longer it takes to recover. It's a painful lesson, but it is. These destinations are going to rebound. There's no doubt about that. The question is, how long will it take? You know, we've seen with Tunisia, with Egypt, that it's taking much longer, or it's basically stalled right now for some of these destinations. Um, but the question, obviously, is when is Paris going to be back? And by the way, there is a ripple effect throughout other destinations. We'll see this in a minute. Actually, that's what it is, which is we can all, always argue and say, well, that's a Paris and Brussels event. It's not. It's, there is a ripple effect. Why is there a ripple effect? Because when you think about the people who are flying, you know, you're talking about visit friends and family, expatriates, workers, 
you're talking about corporate guys, you know, and all these people have good reasons for traveling, and they will resume their traveling habit. But the problem is the leisure crowd. The leisure crowd is the one we all want, because they are the ones spending, because they are the one that we can gear into one direction or another. And this one is fickle, because they think if they are long haul, they think continent. Should I go to Europe right now? Well, why don't I stay around, you know? So as you can tell, Istanbul is sev severely hit as well. Uh, and, and a lot of destinations were, were hit. Um, I'll, I'll pass on this, you know, London is very much impacted as well. Um, but I think there are some more, more positive findings. You know, I needed to take you through the reality of the situation here. But one of the realities as well is that the industry reinvented itself. You know, people don't stop traveling because of what happened in France. And we thought we'd look at what happened during Chinese New Year. For retailers, Chinese New Year is like, you know, the year, the, the moments that you have to focus on. And what happened this year is you compare the Chinese New Year, you know, same period, not calendar period, but same period uh, over itself, I may say, you really see that um, the Chinese people have been traveling plus 14% when compared to last year, which is pretty healthy for international, right? And, but the, fake, the fact is that they started to go to other destinations. They did not come to Europe so much, minus 5.5 or 4%. They did go to the US, which could have been unexpected. They definitely did go to Southeast Asia and South Asia. So that's the good news. The travel industry reinvented itself. You just need to have a hotel in each of these destinations, obviously. I'm just going to take the couple of minutes I have left just to zoom into the Middle East. The Middle East, as by our standards, has been pretty depressed year to day, right? In terms of reservations, right? Um, um, the um, uh, destinations such as Europe uh, have been pretty good, uh, but the growth altogether, talking about outbound Middle East uh, into uh, uh, the world, is 3%. What we're finding out in terms of metrics, I think, is that there is more leisure people traveling here. But the very fascinating metrics, frankly, is that the lead time is shrinking further. We all know that the Middle East market is known for last minute bookings. And that is further consolidating year over year. The zero to four days is, is, is growing to the, you know, to, to, to the speed of light further. Uh, reaching 35% of the bookings that we have on our system. Um, and when you look forward-looking, well, that's a bit of a worry, okay? Because forward-looking, we're minus 8%. So yeah, maybe there's a number of things happening. Maybe Ramadan is changing dates, you know. But all this put together, uh, there is a situation. You know, minus 8% here, minus eight, uh, 12 to Europe that we can understand, minus 13 to the US, that cannot be explained. Um, and actually, um, we zoomed into the Ramadan period, which obviously is forthcoming. So when you look at the reservation that people have already made about the Ramadan, well, those reservations are made. There's no problem. And if you look at just the Ramadan period and compare it in the, under a calendar perspective, if you will, you're, you're seeing a hit of 19% up, which is exciting. However, if you compare those same periods, taking into account the Ramadan this year is, is earlier. No, it's earlier, yes, uh, you're still looking at a deficit of 13%. So right now, in the bookings processed from the Middle East it, for international destination during and after the Ramadan, we have a deficit of 13%. And actually, when I look at this deficit, I have to accept that a lot of these source markets that you have here have this deficit. So we've all, let's be clear on what we're saying here. We're looking at the people, what the people have booked, basically, um, until, um, uh, I mean, a very recent date, basically, until, until now, basically. So what you have to take into consideration that this, that this graph takes is, is taking two dimensions. Later bookers that will book later, and therefore the figures will go up, and the fact that there is an actual deficit. So it doesn't mean that, for example, Kuwait will truly be minus 38%. But it does mean that right now it doesn't look good. And even though there is a, 
a huge burst of last minute booking, there is a possibility that uh, the travel patterns uh, during the, uh, uh, the Ramadan period will be negative. I have been looking into capacity. This is not meaning, by the way, that uh, the airlines uh, are uh, not betting on the future. When you look at uh, the uh, seats available, uh, made available by the airlines in the, in, the forward, for in, the, in the future, you see that you can consider an increase of 9%, and you're finding the same old, old group of people here, Emirates, Qatar, Etihad, Saudi, etc. There are betting uh, on increased routes uh, in, a, in a fairly global fashion, right? So even though there is a deficit, it seems that the airlines are remaining confident. However, uh, forces to admit that uh, uh, um, obviously the Middle East is a regional market before being an international market, uh, and that regional market is growing to the uh, a speed which is at par, if you will, with this. Um, and which, which um, yeah, and, and meaning that there is confidence in the market, even though the bookings are not coming right now. And to finish, I'd like to say that based on our data, uh, Middle East in general is obviously a transit dominated business and will continue to be. Uh, it's further growing, it's growing by 12%, when the visitors, those that are actually staying, are only growing by 4%. So that there is an issue that everybody knows about, and I can just back that up with, with some of this data. Issue as a hotelier in Middle East, I guess, you know. And uh, the, f the fastest growing uh, category here is the traveler spending uh, four to five nights. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been trying to uh, use some of our air reservation to, to give you insight on those trends. I'm happy to answer any question if we have uh, time for this. We don't have time for this. I look forward to uh, speaking to you if you have any question outside of this. Thank you very much for your attention.